Okay, so um, well, I'm ready to go whenever you are. Yeah. So hello, everyone. Welcome back to our monthly speaker event hosted by the San Jose Astronomical Association. If you're unfamiliar with what we do, we're an organization of astronomy enthusiasts, and we host numerous events throughout the year, uh, such as these speaker events, star parties, and solar observing. Uh, you can learn more about us at sjaa.net, and always feel free to reach out if you're interested in joining or helping out. Today with us, we have Professor Thomas Madura from San Jose State University, who will be sharing with us some of the first observations with the James Webb Space Telescope that show how dust shells around Wolfram binaries can enrich uh, the interstellar medium with organic compounds and carbonaceous dust. Great, thank you very much. So I would like to thank um, the San Jose Astronomical Association for uh, this opportunity to um, talk to you all and to share my work. So I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen and um, begin the presentation. Um, if anyone has any questions at any point, um, please feel free to, uh, to ask. Um, but yes, yeah, so I'm going to be um, talking about um, this image here, which is um, an image taken by the uh, James Webb Space Telescope um, of the dusty binary um, WR140. Um, so one of the things I wanted to say is that um, this work would not be possible if it weren't for a large international team of scientists from around the world. Um, this is just uh, a, a short list of some of the names of some of the people that um, have participated in this project. Um, and I am just one small part of it. Uh, my main background is on the um, theoretical interpretation of the observations and also on some of the education and uh, public outreach aspect of this work. But I just wanted to acknowledge um, all of the people that have been involved in this project because uh, the James Webb Space Telescope really is a, uh, an international effort. Okay, so um, in the title of this talk is this thing that says uh, Wolf Ray Star, so the Wolf Ray Star WR140. Um, but what is a Wolf Ray Star? Um, so before we can actually talk about what a Wolf Ray Star is, we need to understand a little bit about um, the most massive luminous stars that exist in our universe. Um, and these are what we typically call uh, O stars. So this would be um, the image that would be on the right side of your screen. Um, so these are the most massive stars that exist. They, um, in this case, are about um, 30 times the mass of our sun, and they are extremely hot, extremely massive, um, and extremely luminous. Now, when I say hot, um, we're talking about 30,000 Kelvin, um, typically greater than um, eight to 10 times the mass of our sun, and they are about 10,000 times uh, more luminous than our sun, but that's the minimum. Um, these things can be as luminous as a million times the luminosity of our sun. Um, and to give you an idea of how our sun compares to these massive stars, um, in the upper left is um, our sun, what our sun would look like uh, to scale with one of these massive stars. And it would have a temperature of only about 5,800 Kelvin. Um, these massive stars are extremely rare and short-lived. So we're talking, when I say rare, we're talking about maybe one in two million stars is a star of this mass um, in, the, uh, in the local universe. Um, and because they are so luminous, um, they're extremely short-lived and they typically have uh, what we call main sequence lifetimes of only about 10 million years. So because they're so massive and luminous, they burn through their nuclear fuel much faster than a star like our sun. And so they live much, much shorter lives. Um, and the reason these stars are important is because uh, they typically make up the heavy elements uh, up to iron before they eventually um, experience core collapse and explode as supernovae. Okay, so then what is this wolf Rey star? Well, before the star actually goes supernova, um, near the end of its life, uh, the star reaches uh, an evolutionary phase that we call the wolf Rey phase. 
Um, and this, these Wolf Rayet stars are typically the descendants of these really extremely massive stars. And they've typically lost um, some of their uh, outer portions. Um, and uh, as a result of being more evolved, they're extremely hot. So typically greater than 40,000 Kelvin um, and also extremely, extremely bright. So we're talking um, 100,000 times the luminosity of our sun uh, and greater. Now, because these stars are so luminous, uh, they actually produce an interesting effect that I'll talk more in detail about in the next couple of slides. And that is that these stars are so bright, so intense in the radiation that the radiation actually interacts with the atoms in the atmosphere and pushes them off into space um, at about a thousand kilometers a second or a few million miles an hour. And we call this a, uh, a radiation-driven stellar wind. And because of this radiation-driven stellar wind, um, and this is an important aspect of the talk, um, these wolf ray stars are continuously losing mass because of this radiation-driving effect. And so the luminosity, the stars are so bright that they're literally kind of blowing themselves apart. Um, the radiation is propelling material out into space um, at really high speeds. Okay, so what is the, uh, how does this really work? So, I mean, all stars basically are the balance of two forces. Um, there's a gravitational force that's always trying to pull things in. But then there's radiation that is spewing outward that's being made by all the nuclear reactions that are going on inside the star. And so all a star really is, is it's basically just a tug of war between these two strong forces, right? So we have this gravitational force trying to collapse everything in. And then we have the radiation force, so the light that's basically pushing everything out. But massive stars, because they're so bright and because these have the, they, these high mass loss rates, um, they're losing between um, 10 to the minus 7 to 10 to the minus 3 suns per year. Um, now, what this means is that even though a massive star has a really short life, it can lose about half of its mass in just a few million years of its life. Um, so a star can, you know, a massive star can lose half of its starting mass just before it dies. And to give you some context, um, the sun, a star like the sun, um, its mass loss rate is 10 million times smaller than the smallest mass loss rate from a massive star. And so even though the sun exists for 10 billion years, it will only lose about 0.01% of its initial mass in its stellar wind, in its solar wind. Um, so that just goes to show you the difference between these massive stars um, and a star like the sun. Okay, so why does this, so to give you an illustration of what this actually looks like, um, this is a image from the Hubble Space Telescope of a wind-blown bubble from a uh, relatively nearby massive star. So the massive star, let me see if I can put my little laser pointer on here. Um, so the massive star that's creating this bubble is this kind of reddish pinkish star here. And then the stellar wind that's blowing from this star is creating this bubble, which is created by the, um, the wind from the star interacting with the surrounding interstellar medium. Uh, and the reason the bubble isn't perfectly symmetric around the star is because as we can see up here in the upper left, there happens to be more material in space around this star in the upper left direction than in the lower right. And that makes the bubble um, asymmetric. But what it boils down to is just this, these stars are continuously blowing material out in space uh, all the time. Now, it turns out if we have a binary system with two stars, um, each star being a massive star, then each one will have its own stellar wind. And what will actually end up happening is a very interesting effect 
which is that uh, when you have two stars going around in a binary orbit with each other, the two winds from the stars will actually slam together and collide and create what we call um, a shock. And basically that's just where all of the energy from the material moving off into space at again, millions of miles an hour, it slams together and all of that energy from that high speed has to go somewhere and it typically goes into um, heat and we get a shock front where the two winds collide. Um, and uh, as I'll talk about in a little bit, we think what actually ends up happening is, is where this inner, where these two winds collide and meet, um, a lot of interesting complicated physics happens and uh, there's a bunch of mixing and cooling and we think that um, this is a place where um, dust can actually form in the winds, in these colliding stellar winds. So to give you a little bit better idea of what this actually looks like, um, I'm gonna show you uh, an example um, simulation. Um, so this is a supercomputer simulation that I've done um, of a colliding wind binary system. Um, and what we're actually seeing is, is we're looking down on the stars from above and the stars are actually pretty small they're um they're at the very so i'll put the laser pointer on again um so let's just focus on this left panel um so there's one star at the very center and then there's a second star um kind of here it's this little yellow dot um and the two stars are orbiting around each other and we're looking down on the plane of the orbit so imagine we were in space hovering down, looking down on the two stars as they go around each other. Uh, and they're going to orbit around each other counterclockwise. And what the color represents, so on the left, the color represents how much material is coming off of the star um, in its stellar wind. And then on the right, it's the same view, except it's showing the temperature um, where the two winds meet, uh, where the two winds collide. So I will go ahead and start this. So it'll be a, uh, this is a simulation and we should see the motion. So for most of the time, not much interesting happens, um, but this is a very eccentric system. And then eventually as the two stars go around each other, um, the wind doesn't have time to react to the orbital motion of the stars. And we get kind of a beautiful spiral effect um, as the two stars go around each other. Um, and this process repeats um, every time the, stu the two stars orbit around and go around each other. Now, the thing that I want to point out that's going to be important for what we're going to talk about in this talk is this uh, interface where the two winds are colliding and meeting together. Because what ends up happening is, is all of the material that would normally be in the stellar wind um, in this cavity that's carved out by the wind of the second star that material gets compressed and it gets enhanced in density. And where that stuff gets enhanced in density, um, the atoms and the molecules bounce around and they cool off via a process called radiative cooling. And that makes the material cool off and get denser. And, um, and then that is where we think that dust can actually form. Um, and this will be important again, um, for what we're going to talk about as the main point of our talk. So all of this is just kind of setting some background um, for discussing the results that we see with JWST. Okay, so what we basically think happens is that um, we have these two stars. One of them is a wolf ray star. Another one is a, usually a, typically uh, a, an O star. And then the two stars go around and where that shock front is, where the cooling happens, again, we think that's where um, dust forms in the plane of the orbit. And then that dust um, can basically flow outward from the central binary system. Okay, so this is kind of some of the theoretical background, but how do we know that this is actually happening? Well, it turns out that we can actually see these dust spirals actually forming um, in nearby um, binary, massive binary star systems. 
Um, so this is a very famous, um, what we call dusty pinwheel system. And what we're seeing here is an animation. Uh, it's a video uh, of the um, dust being formed by the binary star system, uh, WR104. Um, and these observations were taken with um, the Keck telescope uh, in the infrared at a wavelength of uh, about two micrometers. Um, and the distance of this object is about um, 2.4 thousand parsecs, right? Where a parsec is a, a about three and a third light years. Uh, and the period, the orbital period of this particular binary system um, is a little under a year, so about 220 days. Um, and to give you an idea of the size of this thing, the size of these features, um, I have a, a length scale here on the left, and it's saying that that length bar is about 500 astronomical units, so roughly four to five times the size of our solar system, right? And so this system, um, we just happen to be looking at it um, face on from Earth. And the binary stars, we can't actually see the two individual stars. They, were in, they would be in that bright blob at the center. But what we can see from the infrared emission is this spiral of dust that gets formed and thrown out um, as the two stars um, orbit around. And um, this dust is typically pretty cool in temperature. Um, and that's why it, um, it emits in the infrared. It emits, um, the dust is emitting at infrared wavelengths. It can also emit at radio wavelengths, but the infrared happens to be um, some of the best wavelengths that we can see this. Um, and this is just one of the more famous systems, but there are a bunch of these systems that we found. And by studying them, it turns out that um, we think that the dust production rates in these um, binary systems are actually pretty high as far as dust production goes in the universe. Uh, and so one of the things that we want to know is, um, are these things really what we would call dust factories um, in the universe? And why do we care about dust and molecules? Well, the reason we care is because um, if we want to make new stars or planets or living things, um, we need to have complex molecules and, uh, and dust and elements to form those things. And one of the big questions in astrophysics is, well, where does all of this material come from? Where do all of these heavy elements and complex molecules and everything come from that you know, things like the Earth and life can be formed out of? Um, especially if when the universe formed, it was mostly hydrogen and helium and just a tiny amount of lithium. You know, where did all of the other heavy elements come from? And then how did those heavy elements get dispersed out uh, into space so that we can form complex things? Um, so those are kind of the big questions that we're trying to answer um, with this work. And so the question we have is, are these things really these dust factories that can contribute to um, making more complex um, things in the universe? Okay, so um, there's been a lot of, I won't go into the details of this, but there's been a lot of work, a lot of theoretical work doing modeling to try and understand, you know, how much dust systems like this could potentially um, form. But we actually have some pretty big questions, which are, um, you know, do we really understand this dust formation process? You know, some of our theoretical models say that this dust should form and exist. But do we really understand how it's forming? Um, and more importantly, how is it surviving? Um, and we want to know how does dust form um, and survive in these hostile environments? Now, when I say hostile environment, what do I mean? So one of the things that's actually really, really puzzling about these um, binary systems, these massive binary systems that we see dust forming in, is that if you remember from one of my first slides, I said that these stars are extremely hot, right? They're on the order of 30 to 40,000 Kelvin, right? So many times hotter than our sun. But the thing about a star that, that's hot, that, that is that hot is um, it's emitting a lot of radiation. 
but it's also emitting a lot of radiation um, in the ultraviolet. Um, and as you all probably well know, you know, ultraviolet radiation is not exactly the most um, safe thing to be around, right? That's why we put sunscreen on when we go outside. It's also extremely harmful not only to living things, but it's also extremely harmful to dust and complex molecules. So one of the big puzzles that we're still trying to understand is how the heck is dust forming and surviving around two giant, hot, massive stars that are emitting tons of UV radiation. Naively, we would think that the dust and molecules should be just broken up and destroyed by this UV radiation, um, but it doesn't. It survives. And some of, some of the things that we're trying to understand is, well, how does it survive and how well can it survive? Okay, so how do we answer these big questions? Well, what you do is you get NASA to build you a multi-billion dollar space telescope and launch it into space. Um, and you try to answer these and some other big questions. Now, when uh, James Webb was first launched, even before it was launched, um, NASA put out a, a request for um, what were called early release science proposals to do some of the very first observations and gather some of the very first data with the James Webb Space Telescope at, right after it was launched. Um, and it turns out that there were only 13 teams in the world that were selected to get some of these um, early release data science um, programs. And our team was one of the lucky 13. So we were one of the 13 to get um, some of the very first data from James Webb. Uh, so we were extremely, extremely fortunate. Um, and this was uh, led by our PI, Ryan Lau, who is now um, in Arizona. And we were trying to understand how dust forms and survives around these um, binary star systems. And there are some other details that I'll talk about about why we wanted to do this project. OK, so I see a question in the chat. Yep, OK. So if our, if our meeting ends a little early, um, we'll come back. Um, we'll just go ahead and rejoin, and I'll pick up right where I left off. OK, so we are going to talk about um, this thing. So some of you may be familiar with the James Webb Space Telescope, but I'll just spend one slide talking about it real briefly before we may have to um, take an intermission and then come back and rejoin the talk. Um, but the James Webb Space Telescope, as I'm sure a lot of you are probably uh, have heard about, is NASA's new flagship space telescope. And it um, is launched, um, it sits at what's called the second Lagrange point in orbit um, with the Earth around the sun. And it is primarily a uh, infrared telescope. So it is designed to look um, at things like galaxies, planets, planet formation, um, cool things like dust and molecules. Uh, and so that is its main mission. And it has a lot of different scientific instruments, but the scientific instrument that I will be talking about and focusing on is this one called MIRI, which is the uh, mid uh, 